What preparation is necessary to respond to, for hospitals to respond to mass casualty events? Dr. Jacobs is professor and chairman of traumatology at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut. He is an international expert in trauma, trauma education, and pre-hospital care and disaster management. He really had a lot to do in the Newtown disaster, Newtown multiple casualty event shootings that occurred back in 2012 in December and has been part of uh, so the, a lot of analysis over those kinds of events. Lynn is a true um, leader in the, our field and is, we're really fortunate to have him. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobs. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I just want to focus, if you will, on the real issue of how we're going to improve survival from these mass casualty events. The first issue is we're located in Connecticut, which is about 100 miles. We're in the center of Connecticut. It's 100 miles north of New York City and 100 miles south of Boston. So we were pretty highly focused on the events that occurred in 911, and it changed the way we thought about mass casualty events. And then recently, a year ago, we had a major shooting event in a high school, uh, in a, a, a children's school here, which again brought it into sharp focus. So now, let me try and move forward with how to survive. First order of business is it has to be coordinated. The event is in the pre-hospital area. It can be anywhere, any time of day or night. And so you have to have a response from the police, the fire, the rescue services, and emergency medical services. You then have to link that very, very tightly to all the hospitals in the region. And within each hospital, all the departments have to be able to stop what they're doing and respond maximally to what is going on. The next key thing is to identify very early the type magnitude and severity of the event because the response is going to be different. It is different if there's a shooting versus an explosion versus a sarin gas type um, event. And in terms of magnitude, a school is different from than uh, a major apartment building and is different from a major city. The severity also can be very different and all of those things really do have to be identified early because that calibrates the response. The next key is that one has to rapidly respond to the scene and, that in, and then initially manage and sort out the victims so that you can get a quick understanding so all the hospitals can begin to gear up for whether this is just minor cuts and bruises, a small number of walking wounded, or a maximal number of patients which are gonna overwhelm hospitals then transportation to the hospital has to be well thought out, either by air or ground, as it may involve multiple hospitals in a very significant location. The, the uh, American College of Surgeons recognized that this is a major event and called together a group which developed a report which is called the Hartford Consensus. And the purpose of that was to increase survival from active shootings and intentional mass casualty events, one of which would be the Boston Marathon explosion. Now, if you note, there's a hot zone which is dangerous. There's usually an active shooter there or a bomb is being set to explode it. So that is very significant danger. The warm zone is out of line of shooter. It's not secure. It's not fairly hemorrhage control and then very rapid extraction cold or safe zone where the patient can be fully assessed and then identified as walking wounded, severely injured, or nearly dead, and then rapid transport to hospital. So those are the key uh, features, if you will, of the zones. In terms of the active super, we came up with this acronym, THREAT. Suppress the threat, which is to say stop any active shooting, control bleeding, get involved with rapid extrication, and then assess the patient and triage and transport that patient to the hospital. Hospital preparedness and response, and if you can, thank you. 
Um, that is really key. So we've left the pre-hospital arena, and now we're in the hospital. The hospital is usually notified by pre-hospital pe people that there is an event, and it's important, and you should really be paying attention. That will trigger a central command structure. And then the appropriate decision maker, usually the senior uh, administrative person and the senior medical person, really need to be involved. They need to stop what they're doing, take charge, and make decisions. The disaster plan has to be initiated. Nothing really happens until that is sent over the loudspeaker system and alerts people that this is not a drill, this is a real disaster, and identifies the type of disaster. That triggers opening the hospital disaster command center, which can be anywhere, but it definitely has to be set up to be able to manage and control and command all the resources needed for this disaster. Appropriate personnel are then assembled and brought into the center. Now, communication is really important. Obviously, the data from the pre-hospital people needs to be brought in to the hospital, and that quantifies the type of response. So, for instance, if there are multiple torso injuries, either from shooting or an explosion, that is going to result in hemorrhagic shock, and generally speaking, that's a general surgical emergency, and emergency physicians, general surgeons, nurses, etc., have to be ready to deal with massive hemorrhagic shock in multiple people. If there are multiple fractures, things falling on top of people, breaking limbs, legs, arms, etc., that is an orthopedically quantified response. And then, of course, if there are toxic agents like sarin, this becomes really pretty important that this is a completely different type of disaster requiring pulmonary and ICU support. Communication, therefore, from the command center to the emergency department and from the emergency department back to the command center because that's where the, the patients come into emergency. The communication goes to the center, and then it's across to the various units, whether they're operating rooms, intensive care units, support services, and so you have a completely well-integrated hospital response. A word on communication. If there's a large number of casualties, the precision in that, and this has to be taught to the people giving the information. So, if they, you get a report, a, a, a communication which says there are 50 patients all with injuries, yes, that is a major problem. That pretty much no hospital can handle that with the standard. So they're going to have to go into disaster mode. But it's very different if those patients just have cuts and bruises or those patients are, have torso injuries. Similarly, they, if they have extremity injuries, that's a major problem orthopedic affair, or if it's all mustard gas, that becomes, again, a major different type of response. So the type of response or communication we would like is there are 50 patients, five of which have a hypotensive torso injury with an estimated time of arrival of 10 minutes to your hospital. That gives you 10 minutes to obtain operating rooms, blood, the appropriate people to deal with torso injuries, and you know exactly what your response calibration should be. In the command center, they're charged to calibrate this response, and obviously you have to have significant numbers of doctors, nurses, ancillary personnel. If it's a big response, like 50 patients, immediately cancel elective surgery, free up operating beds, uh, operating rooms, and free up equipment. You need to move people out of intensive care to step-down units if you can, and that frees up extra operating rooms, extra ICU beds. And then elective radiology should be canceled because a lot of imaging is really important, and that is going to overwhelm the elective capabilities. So they should be canceled, and the uh, ICU, excuse me, the um, CT scan and interventional capacities should be rapidly expanded. Remember to maintain all the staff. If this is coming close to shift time, do not send anybody home. 
they need to be maintained on site until the, the magnitude and severity of the disaster is, is ascertained, and then you can calibrate whether people can go home or not. And similarly, this is a chance to enhance the, state, the capability by bringing in extra people. So the responsibilities in the command center communicate with external resources, whether they be local, the state, the, the nation, to calibrate that response. A New York City 911 response requires a massive in national response, whereas a small event, which is devastating for that area, but only has 10 or 12 patients, that does not require a regional or national response. The scope and duration are important, and then public relations is critical. If it's particularly a school or a public place, the families of those people deluge the hospital, both electronically, uh, by telephone, and by physically coming to the hospital. And that can block up all the access routes, and those need to be clearly opened and managed by the security forces. And also have a staff which deals with that so that that doesn't become an emergency of itself. Financial reimbursement is very important. You're stopping all the activities of the hospital and utilizing different resources. And these things need to be quantified and recorded so that uh, when a federal or national or state disaster plan gives the ability to get additional finances, it's well recorded. Command center. The leadership is key. It should be anyone who is charged to make those important decisions. And remember, this can occur in the daytime, in the night, on nights or weekends. So it will be different people. But they have to have the authority to make decisions, to cancel operations, to close portions of the hospital, stop elective work, and then increase and call in other people. So there are substantial administrative responsibilities which need to be spelled out and tested prior to the event. Dr. Jacobs? Yes. Hey, dinner up. For the, we're actually running a little bit over. Would you mind giving us sort of the summary points of, of what you said and what you think are the critical points you wanted to make here? Sure. Let me go, if you will, to the end of the presentation, which okay. would be um, a brief, uh, excuse me, one more, the challenges. Okay. So the challenges are the pre-hospital communications have to be well thought out. They have to be practiced and drilled. Triage has to be a clear part of the pre-hospital personnel so that patients are identified and moved to the appropriate place. Everything needs to be documented, responsibilities aligned, and then the logistics have to be in place and practiced. And then finally, in the new concepts, all of this should be active. Next, it shouldn't next. be passive. It shouldn't be next waiting slide. to occur. You really do need to have fully practiced drills where all components, pre-hospital and hospital, work together to make sure that they're fully able to respond at the appropriate time in any time of day or night. Thank you. Great job. Dr. Jacobs, thank you very thank much. You very That's much. excellent. That was really excellent. Uh, I'd like to move ahead, and, and, and will you please stay around for the uh, panel?